so I'm delighted to welcome virtually Andrea Arnold from Worcester Polytechnic, who's going to talk to us today about sequential Bayesian methods for parameter estimation and applications within the GDF. So please take a look. Thanks very much, Francis and Bill and Sean and all of the organizers for the invitation. Um, I really appreciate being able to participate today. Uh, apologies for not being able to be there in person, but I'm very happy to be here remotely and uh, have been enjoying the program thus far. Uh, so as uh, was mentioned, I'll, I'll talk a little bit today about my work in sequential Bayesian methods for parameter estimation. And I have a few applications uh, that I've worked on relating to imaging data. So it's a couple different types of, of imaging data that I'll discuss today in light of this uh, idea of informing models um, and learning more about the, the characteristics of those uh, systems via the parameters. Uh, but just as a bit of an introduction by way of introduction of my research, um, my work generally focuses on inverse problems and uncertainty quantification which is incorporating different elements of applied and computational math. Statistics, um, as I'll mention later on, I'm a Bayesian statistician with respect to the framework in which I'm solving the inverse problems and uh, aspects as well as scientific computing. So the, the main goals of my research, um, and, and I will talk a little bit more about some of my uh, projects as we, as we go along, has been to work on the design of efficient numerical algorithms for parameter estimation in different contexts. Specifically, um, and as I'll talk about today, we're thinking of problems where we have data that's arriving sequentially from a system. So this could be some type of online measurement system where we're receiving information in real time or online sequentially, and we're trying to use this data that's arriving to inform some unknown characteristics or some maybe variables of interest with respect to a given system. And I work on the algorithmic development side and also the side of application where I'm taking these algorithms and applying them to real world problems. I've worked in a variety of application areas, um, but specifically my interest lies in biology and medical applications. Uh, so I have a couple listed here. I've worked a little bit in epidemiological applications, uh, neuroscience, and um, recently in medical robotics and looking at laser tissue interactions, which I hope to tell you about a little bit later on um, at the end of the talk. So it's just an overview of my research um, and the general uh, problems that I aim to address. So what I'd like to do today um, is give a kind of overview of these types of approaches that I work in, these sequential Bayesian approaches for parameter estimation, outline the problem and go through an overview of, of what these methods look like. And then I will um, discuss a few different applications looking at real world data, where the data is coming from some type of imaging modality. Okay, so the problem that I will be addressing is this idea of estimating parameters in dynamical systems. So this problem of parameter estimation does remain a challenge in many problems that are still being studied today as we rely on looking at mechanistic models for real world applications. This question becomes quite um, important, specifically with respect to quantifying uncertainty in our estimates. We don't want to only be able to estimate an unknown, but we'd like to have some idea of how certain our estimate is or how reliable our estimate is. And so the question of uh, these parameters, and I'll, I'll define this mathematically on the next slide, is that we have some type of system and it's characterized by some parameters uh, that we'll discuss that maybe inform some type of characteristics of the system behavior. So in general, the parameters can have different behavior themselves. In many cases, they're assumed to be constant or maybe static in time, so just some constant parameter that's affecting the system. But the parameters themselves can also vary with time. And if they do, considering that they're a parameter, we assume right that they, they can't be measured. So these parameters are something that we're not measuring, but they might also change with time with unknown dynamics. So we might have an idea that they should remain constant in time, we might have an idea that they should change with time, but we don't really know how they should change with time. We don't have an evolution model for these things. So in the case of the time varying parameters or these ones that are varying with time, 
uh, this is what I'm referred to as time varying parameters or TVPs. And uh, kind of in best case scenario, I'd like the algorithms that I'm developing to be able to detect whether the parameter of interest is constant or if it is changing with time. And if it is changing, I'd like to be able to detect those changes in real time as the data is arriving. So the Bayesian uh, sequential Bayesian framework that I'm working in is a very natural framework for this. And it's allowing us the flexibility to be able to address these types of questions where we're just given our data. And we'll talk a little bit more about the data, but it's of course, noisy data, partial data, indirect data. And we'd like to try to infer whether these parameters are constant, static, and estimate these along with some level of uncertainty uh, in their characterization. I just have a couple examples listed here of the types of maybe systems and parameters that we're talking about here. So for example, if we're thinking about harmonic oscillators in the terms of a physical model, we might have some type of external forcing parameter that's involved or the stiffness parameter with respect to uh, the model. In certain cases, these could be constant. In certain cases, these could change with time, either both or one or the other. So we'd like our estimation to be able to detect this. Um, in epi epidemiology and these epidemic models, we have the transmission parameter. Often cases this could change with time over the course of the pandemic, for example, or it may be we know something about its periodicity. Maybe it has some type of structural behavior that we know that it repeats, but it has some type of uh, time variance as well. Um, I have a couple other examples here. One that I'd like to discuss later on are looking at the tissue physical properties during uh, a laser procedure. So a medical laser procedure like a photothermal therapy or something along these lines where we might have a tissue and as we're applying the, the laser, we'd like to understand or infer upon the properties of that tissue as it's changing potentially with uh, the procedure. So. Uh, there's many more examples that I haven't included here. These are just some in the biological and medical field uh, that I've been interested in, in pursuing. Um, but these are also widely applicable to a lot of different application areas where we might have some mechanistic model, unknown parameters, and we'd like to understand these better. Now, to put it in a little uh, bit more of a mathematical framework, uh, I mentioned dynamical systems, so we are going to assume a deterministic dynamical system. Specifically here, I have it written in the form of a system of ordinary differential equations. We can also think about partial differential equations, and one of the later applications will involve a PDE model. Uh, but for the time being, let's assume this ODE model, where we have uh, the dynamics of the system states. So dx dt is given by this function f of time. It can involve the states. So here x is a vector uh, of the model states. Theta is going to be a vector of the unknown model parameters. So this model is parameterized by theta. And we're going to assume that we know the mapping f. So f is just going to be our known mapping, the right-hand side of the differential equations. And here we assume also, right, for the initial value problem that we have some sort of initial uh, value vector. This vector x0, it could be known and assumed, or it might also be unknown or uncertain. So we could also consider the initial value as another parameter or a vector of parameters that we could augment onto our unknowns and estimate along the way, if it in the case where it is unknown or uncertain. Okay. So given this model, we're going to assume that we have some right, and this is representing some system, we're going to assume that we have some discrete noisy observations of the system that are given to us. Again, these could be direct observations of the system components, or they could be some sort of nonlinear combination of the system components and parameters. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But my goal for the inverse problem is to then estimate and quantify uncertainty in the unknown parameters given these system observations, right? So we're going to try to estimate the theta for a given system, assuming only some partial noisy measurements of the system states or some combination of the states themselves. Okay. So as you might imagine, there are different ways that you can approach this inverse problem. 
the approach that I'm taking, um, you know, as mentioned, is this sequential uh, Bayesian approach, which are known as uh, filtering methods. So you may have heard some of these uh, algorithm names before. I'm just giving an overview here. So when I say a Bayesian filtering method, what I mean is this sequential statistical approach that's going to use model predictions. So these will be forward predictions from our dynamical system and the available data that we have to update and estimate our unknown parameters in this two-phase updating scheme. And I'll highlight the scheme a little bit more um, in the following slides, but the idea is that we're gonna use the model to predict, and then we're gonna use the data to correct. So I often like to refer to these similarly as predictor-corrector type methods, except that we're now under the Bayesian framework. So we're in a statistical framework where any of the unknowns right, in the Bayesian framework are modeled as random variables. So they have a probability distribution attached. And the solution of the inverse problem isn't just a point estimate, but in fact, it is the posterior probability density function of our unknowns conditioned on the available data. So the idea with the uh, filtering approaches, these sequential methods, is that we're going to start with some prior distribution on our unknowns, and we're going to update the probability distribution via some discrete sample that's representing that underlying distribution sequentially as each of the data points arrive. So we'll move forward with a model prediction. We'll could then correct that prediction via the available data, and we'll continue forward, right, as each new data arrives and update these probability density functions as we go up until the end of the data stream, at which point we have our posterior. So the benefit or one of the benefits of, of looking at this problem in the Bayesian framework is that we do have encoded within the probability distributions a natural measure of uncertainty that's given in really the, the shape or the, the deviation around the mean of our distribution. So I'll, I'll show this um, as we go forward. In this framework, we consider the mean of the posterior distribution as our final estimate. And we can think about the uncertainty being encoded in really the, uh, the credible intervals or the, the deviations around that mean distribution in terms of our uh, final sample. So I've kind of uh, discussed this generally and in this framework, there are a variety of different Bayesian filtering methods that you could use. Each of them has their own algorithmic formulation, but the uh, kind of most popular classes I would say are referred to as particle filters. So you may have seen different, a variety of different particle filtering schemes. These are also called sequential Monte Carlo schemes. So you can use either of these terms to describe these uh, approaches, right? There's Monte Carlo sampling intrinsic within the uh, equations of the algorithms. There's also this class of Kalman filtering schemes or Kalman type filters, specifically ensemble Kalman filtering. And this became quite popular right, in the geophysical space, but is now being utilized in a lot of different spaces. And we can use this in the type of problems that I'm interested in. Um, as another alternative Bayesian filtering method uh, to the particle filters. So I've developed algorithms in both of these frameworks. They have different updating equations. I won't go into detail uh, specifically with respect to the, uh, you know, fine details of the algorithms for any of these cases today. But if you're interested, I'd be happy to chat a little bit more offline about this. They both follow a similar framework in terms of the goal of the, of the schemes. So as I mentioned, the general goal, we'll start with a, a prior right at time zero. And at each step, right, so at time j, our idea, our goal is to def design a sampling scheme that's going to perform our sequential posterior update from our joint probability distribution at time j. So here, right, we have the distribution of our states x at time j and those parameters also at time j, conditioned on the available data, which I'll denote here as y sub j. And I want to take this distribution and I want to update it to the next time point. 
So I would now like the posterior at time j plus one conditioned on the data up to time j plus one. And we'll do this update in two steps with the prediction from the model and the correction from the observation. Okay. So in order to do this, we need to now think about the statistical framework and how we would pair our deterministic dynamical system that we saw on the previous slide to this now Bayesian framework. And we can do this via a state space model um, that I have written here. These can be more general. I'm writing them in this particular form. So the idea is that we want to now pair our dynamical system with this statistical framework. And we'll have these two equations that we're going to use to formulate our state space model. Both of these are discrete time Markov models, so they follow the Markov properties. And each of them is using a different piece of information in this two-phase update in order to um, propagate our sample forward and then correct our sample via the observations. So in terms of updating the, the states of our model, we use the state evolution equation, right? Everything's in a capital letter. These are now random variables. So our predicted states at time j plus one are given by this operator, which I'm going to call f, that takes in the current states at time j and the parameter values. And this operation is actually, for our case, where we pair in the dynamical system, us taking the numerical solution to the dynamical system, right, given our right initial values at time j, propagating that forward, solving the equations uh, to get our numerical solution at time j plus one. So the uh, dynamical system right, is embedded within this operator. And then we're adding on some innovation, right? So this could also be thought of as maybe some error, modeling error, right? A little bit of noise that we're adding then to the process. And this is the general equation for the random variable. When we think of the actual sample, we're doing this for each of the, the sample points as well. So we're following this procedure for each of the points in our sample. Okay. Is, how do you determine C? I'm sorry, I, if I heard that correctly, it was how do I determine C? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. That's actually one of my uh, research questions is how do we determine C appropriately? Um, so I should say, right, this innovation process, right, I'm modeling it here as just a, a Gaussian random variable with this uh, covariance matrix C. Uh, right, I have this formulated right now that C is, is a static constant matrix. In general, this could actually vary with time. This could be time invariant as well. Um, but just for simplicity, I'm writing it here as, as a constant matrix. And this is actually one of the cruxes of, of these types of algorithms is how do we appropriately choose C? So this can be done in different ways. If you have some type of um, information that you know that you can try to set this, um, this is this has been uh, in much of the literature something that maybe needs to be tuned a bit before the the um, the filter is run. And I've also done some work on ways to systematically set this before uh, so that this um, estimate is. And there's been uh, work done as well. Different different uh, works in the literature have been done to try to set this matrix as well as this matrix D that I'll talk about down here. Um, either systematically during the filtering process or somehow from some knowledge beforehand, right? So that's a great question because that's actually an open question. There's, there's different approaches that are taken to try to, to, try to set these uh, matrices and they are quite vital in terms of the estimates that you will produce. So that's a very important question. Okay, so the state evolution will propagate forward in terms of our using our dynamical model to make a forward prediction. Then the observation equation is what relates our observed data back to the model variables. So I will denote the observations by yj plus one. And these are given as a function, right? So g of the states that were now predicted from the evolution equation and the parameter values, plus this W uh, J plus one represents a noise process uh, with respect to the observation error. 
So again, there's a uh, matrix that we need to set here. This covariance matrix for the observation error also needs to be determined in some manner. And this observation function really depends on the application and the types of data that we have available. So in the most maybe basic form, it could be some type of linear operation where we have a projection matrix that's picking out which of the variables of our uh, states, X, that we actually can directly measure. So if we can measure one state but not the other, right, we might have a projection matrix that's pulling out the first state and zeroing out the second since we don't have an observation there. We could have some sort of linear combination of the different states, and I'll show an example of an application where we do have something like this. Also, more generally, we could have a nonlinear function. So, for example, if we're looking at uh, an epidemic model, we might actually be considering as the observation uh, some type of cumulative number of cases over a certain period of time. So we could have nonlinear terms that are involved uh, in this function as well, which then, depending on the algorithm, can make things a little more challenging. Okay. So this function will be determined based on the application and the data that we have available. But this is what helps to inform the update with respect to the observations and plays into the likelihood function, right? So the state space model is directly tied to how we're actually updating this within the Bayesian framework. The evolution equation helps us with the transition from time j to j plus one, and the observation equation is helping us to inform the likelihood function. Okay. okay, does that sound good so far? Any other questions at this point? So now to the parameters, right? So this is the general framework uh, that we would set up. And now if our aim is to estimate the parameters, we can think about the different scenarios that could occur with respect to our vector theta. And in a lot of cases, the methods will assume that theta is a constant parameter in time. And if this is true, if theta is constant, there's a couple things that could occur, right? So the first, I guess this would be our really our maybe dream scenario would be if we knew theta, if we did know all of the parameters of the model, then perfect, we're good. We can go ahead and plug in those parameter values, fix those, and our dependence on theta would be dropped. And we'd be left with what we would refer to as the state estimation problem, where we know the model parameters. Our goal then is to just track the model states over time specifically of interest when we can't measure them all. So maybe we have measurements of some, not all. We'd like to track them all and use the data that we have to inform uh, the tracking of, of all of the states, even the ones that are unmeasured. So this would be the state estimation problem where we're neglecting the parameters. We assume they're known and we fix them. Okay. When theta is unknown, we then need to account for this fact. And if we're assuming that the parameters are unknown but constant, then the general approach is actually to assume that they are in right under right uh, under the hood, they are constant, but we're going to actually try to evolve them over time in this process, which is referred to as artificial time evolution, to actually start with a wide variety of possible parameter values and then converge towards a constant value that is more likely and shrink the uncertainty along the way. So this uh, illustration that I have at the bottom is really demonstrating what I mean by this. So we can think on the left-hand side here that I have a parameter that I'd like to estimate and right along the x-axis, we have the course of time. So you can imagine that the data is arriving over time in this way. And at the starting time zero, this red, is going to denote the mean of my sample from my uh, prior distribution. And the varying levels of gray are the 68 and 95% Bayesian credible intervals of the sample around that mean. Okay. So we started with a fairly wide variety of possible parameter values, right, in this case. And you can see that over time, right, so imagine, and I'll show a video actually in a minute, uh, imagine that data is arriving and we're updating these values. So the parameter mean and the sample starts to move. So over time, it's updating its value of the sample. And we see that it starts to 
change values. So this is the, the artificial evolution. It's changing its values. It's, it's moving around in parameter space until it starts to reach a value that seems reasonable and it converges to this constant, right? So you see that over time, the mean is changing a bit and then eventually it converges to a nice constant value and it stays there for the remainder of uh, the simulation here. In terms of the credible intervals, which we can think of again, this is really the, the um, kind of width in a sense of our sample or our measure of uncertainty, it starts to shrink over time. So the possibility of having this wide variety of parameter values, we'd like to try to refine this. And you can see that over time, as more data arrives, we start to learn more and more about the parameter. The distribution really becomes much more centralized uh, around a value that is, is most likely given the available data. So we see that this uncertainty, right, these uh, intervals are shrinking around the parameter estimate as we get more and more data. Towards the end, we have this nice um, kind of small uncertainty bounds around our mean value. And if we then take the posterior distribution at the last time, we can look at this in terms of a histogram. This is just a smooth histogram of the resulting sample. The red is the mean of this parameter estimate, and then we can see the histogram around this. So we can then use the red uh, mean as an estimate for this parameter, and we have the uncertainty that's encoded uh, within the, the distribution of the parameter values. Okay, okay. so I do have uh, a video that demonstrates this because I think it's, it's nice to see this in action, what these algorithms are actually doing. This is just a, a simple illustrative example. So let me um, stop sharing and reshare for one second. Okay. Can everyone see the, the video slide? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So uh, what you'll see in this video is uh, just a, a simulation of, of, of what I've been describing um, in terms of the filter. So I'm just going to assume I have some system that's dependent on a given parameter theta. And what you'll see as the video plays uh, in the black dots are going to be the observed data that's going to come in from the system. In red, that's going to be our mean estimate. And then in the dashed red bars, it's just plus or minus one standard deviation around the mean, which will be a represent, uh, representation of our uncertainty in the estimate. Uh, so I'll play the video a few times so you can see what's happening, but the system is on the top uh, figure and the parameter estimate is on the bottom figure. And I'm going to assume that I have data arriving from time zero to 20. After that point, I have no more data, but I can use my final value of the parameter to then make forward predictions with my model. And that's what you're going to see up here. Okay. So, right, as you can see, the data is arriving. And what the filtering method is doing is tracking these data points. It's not directly interpolating the data, as you'll notice. Since we don't fully trust the data, we know it's noisy. But we want to balance between our model, what we know from our dynamical model, and what we're given from the data, right? And you can see that as the uh, data points arrived over time, we started with a wide variety of parameter values. And we see this convergence towards a constant value where the uncertainty is shrinking, we are converging to a constant parameter value. And we could, similarly to my previous figure, uh, look at the posterior distribution of this parameter at time 20, which is when we assume that the data stops arriving. Okay. So I'll play it again. You can see, right, as the, as the dots are arriving, how the parameter is actually refining. The estimate of the parameter refines as more and more data arrives. And once we get this posterior estimate of the parameter value, I can plug that back into my dynamical system, I can solve it, and I can make forward predictions of how my system will behave, assuming that I have this parameter value known. Okay. Do your forward predictions also include uncertainty? I'm sorry, I can't, I couldn't hear the question. I was wondering about uncertainty on the system. Like you make the forward predictions, you also have uncertainty on the forward. Yes, so we could make, I, I'm not showing the, the forward propagation of uncertainty here, but we could absolutely use this uncertainty in the parameter to also make forward propagation of uncertainty on the predictions, yes. I'm just showing in this uh, simulation, I'm just showing the mean of the, uh, really the prediction using the mean value of the parameter. 
how would you expect that uncertainty to behave as, as you can call it, predict the bounds? Would, would we sort of see a reversal of this uncertainty decreasing with it, with it similarly? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, we could, we should expect, right, that if we're if we're propagating forward this uncertainty at each step, that then it would grow over time, right? The more, um, the more that we propagate forward without this, we're assuming that in this case too, that we're we're sort of trusting in a sense that this dynamical model with this parameter value is what we would like to, what we would like to see. But yes, the the uncertainty then would would continue to increase as we're propagating forward. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Okay, so hopefully this helps to illustrate a little bit what's going on. As you might imagine, this is just a, a simple example with one system state and one parameter. In real applications, I have a lot of system states, right? There's, uh, depending on the, the problem, there could be a, few, a small number or there could be a larger number of actual states that we're trying to track of which a subset is observed or maybe some combination is observed. And there are multiple parameters that we'd like to track uh, in terms of the unknown values of theta here. Okay. So I'll hop back to the slides. And uh, start to show uh, one, one real example of where we actually applied this to a specific um, application in neuroscience, specifically looking at uh, the neurodynamics of patients that had varying levels of liver disease. So this is an application, and I promised applications with some imaging data, um, where we did use some dynamic imaging to actually help us infer upon um, this dynamical system of neurochemical kinetics in order to understand some behavior um, with respect to the acetate metabolism in patients with varying uh, levels of liver disease, right? So this was a collaboration with mathematicians and also clinical collaborators that were working on this problem. And the question that was, was being addressed was whether or not the level of ammonia, uh, ammonium in the plasma uh, that is elevated with respect to liver disease, if this was primarily affecting the neurons or the astrocytes in the brain. And so, um, the, this group de developed an experiment where, in order to try to isolate this, right, we can use what uh, is this 111C acetate tracer, which can be metabolized only by astrocytes, not by the neurons. So the idea with this experiment was then to actually say, okay, we're going to, um, and I'll describe the experiment, but we're going to use this uh, acetate tracer to actually isolate the astrocytes from the neurons and determine if there is any change in the way that um, this tracer is actually being taken up or metabolized by um, the brain in the different cases of uh, liver disease in different levels of uh, disease in this case. So uh, just a general outline of, of how the experiment worked. So the patients, um, and there were a group of patients that I'll describe on the next slide, were given a, a radioactive tracer of this acetate uh, concentration that was given in the blood, and this was measured directly uh, in, from the blood over time. So you can see that there's a spike of this tracer, and then over time it, it dissipates from the blood as it moves into the brain, and then it is right, uh, taken up by the astrocytes and, and metabolized. So the way that this was tracked in the brain was using uh, dynamic positron emission tomography imaging, where uh, this was uh, the, the PET imaging was able to track the acetate, uh, the radioactive uh, concentration right, of the acetate in the brain. And we would then look at the voxels right over the dynamic PET imaging to find an average of this tracer uh, concentration in the region of interest. So from the PET imaging, we are able to then uh, extract time series data of the average uh, of the total tracer concentration within the brain tissue uh, over time. And that is what I'm showing here. So you can notice that there is a bit of a delay between when the tracer is actually uh, input into the system and when it is then spiking in the brain. So accounting for the time delay that it would actually take 
uh, to arrive at the brain and then uh, begin the process of, of uh, metabolism. Okay. So we're using these PET images to then extract these time series data, which then I can use uh, with respect to the filtering uh, problem at hand. So this will be our data set. And we have that for 18 specific volunteers that were taken from three groups with uh, varying levels of liver disease. Specifically, there were five uh, healthy control patients. There were seven patients with cirrhotic liver. And there were then six patients with the most extreme level uh, of hepatic encephalopathy, where in each of these cases, really the question of interest was, is there a difference between these groups in terms of this acetate uptake and metabolism um, with respect to these uh, different, different levels of, of disease here? So we were interested in trying to learn about the this characteristics of how this acetate is metabolizing in these patients looking at the different uh, groups that we have here. Okay. So all of these patients underwent the same experimental protocol and we have the data for each individual patient. Sorry, is your model only one variable then? Like the, the tracer, the amount of tracer in the brain? Or are you using like the image of that? It's actually two. So I'm gonna, uh, I'll show you that right now. So we actually have uh, some different compartments. So we have two compartments just looking at this neurochemical kinetic model, where we're going to assume that we have uh, two different compartments of the tracer in the brain. One is what we call the precursor. So this is the direct uh, amount of the uh, acetate, right, when it enters the brain, and then it's going to metabolize and become the CO2 uh, in the second compartment, in the product compartment. So we do have two different uh, kind of forms of the tracer in the brain tissue. And we also have, right, we're modeling in, in this case that we have the tracer, this, this C of T is representing the tracer that's coming in through the blood, right? It's transferring across the blood-brain barrier into the, the tissue, and then it's metabolizing, it's becoming the CO2, and then it can also exit. So you see that in this model, right, we have the two differential equations that are describing the transport from uh, the precursor compartment and the product compartment of the actual uh, tracer in the brain tissue. And we're assuming in terms of our data that our observation is comprising the total sum of the tracer that's actually in uh, the blood and the brain compartments combined. So we have this weighted uh, version of, or weighted value, I should say, of the tracer with respect to this parameter V0, which I'll describe. And then we're summing up the amount of tracer in both of these compartments. Okay. So it's, a, it's really a, a simple two part, uh, compartment model, but we're trying to understand right, the behavior of this tracer uh, and, and the, be the behavior really of the, the different uh, kinetic parameters with respect to this model and each of the individual patients. Okay. So the input from PET is just the numbers M1 and M2? Okay. Say it again, I'm okay. sorry. So when you, you do the PET images, and from that you determine the amount of the tracer and the CO2 that's in the brain? Yes. So its model actually as the sum of those two M1 and M2 plus uh, this weighted value of the, the tracer that might remain in the bloodstream at that time. So it's a compartmental model. Yes. Not a perfect model. You can run these models at each picture, but model. I, I thought you just divided it into uh, astrocytes and non astrocytes or something like that. Is yeah, that... but it's over the whole, the whole of the brain. Uh, okay, so I, I guess we're just wondering how you extract the um, model parameters from the pet images. I'm not sure I fully heard the question. I'm sorry, I'm having a little little trouble hearing that on the it on the side. The definition well. of a compartment. It's like, yeah. How, how, how do you get a, a single number? Oh, okay. So is the question how the data relates to the model, uh, or is the question uh, how how the model was derived from the pet images? How do you extract the ends, for example, from the pet? Okay. So how do we extract this curve from the pet imaging? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Sure. So we actually take, so there's a, um, a representation, right, in the PET imaging of this tracer concentration in uh, 
in the brain. And we would break this down into the different voxels of the image and take an average of the amount of tracer that's in those voxels in the region of interest and take the average of this. And this is how we're getting this uh, tracer. Great. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. And so now this is going to be our input. And then my other, um, I guess, connection then is that we're going to take that tracer and we're going to assume that it's modeled just as the total amount of tracer in the blood and in our brain compartments, right? Okay. So specifically just to highlight these parameters, there's five parameters of interest within the model framework that we'd like to estimate for each of the patients. Uh, this K1 is the clearance of the tracer from, from the blood into the tissue. And this is now entering into this precursor compartment in the tissue. It's also possible that the tracer then goes back into the blood at some rate K2. So this is a transport rate between these compartments. Once this uh, acetate metabolizes, it can then become uh, in, uh, you know, a different version of this, uh, the CO2 in the uh, product compartment at some rate K3. And we assume that uh, it's negligible for it to kind of go back the other in the other direction. So we're not in, uh, including this in the model. We're assuming that it only can uh, right, go from the precursor to the product compartment. And then once it's a product, it can also go back into the bloodstream at some rate K5. So there's four parameters within the actual uh, dynamical system model that we'd like to estimate, right? The K1, 2, 3, and 5. And then within the observation model itself, which again is just going to be um, the total representative of the total amount of tracer, right? That's currently in the blood and the brain tissue. Uh, we also have this parameter, which is uh, I'm denoting as V0, which represents the virtual volume of the capillary. Right. So for each patient, we assume this could be different. So we'd like to estimate this as well. And we're using this to weight the, the total tracer concentration in the blood. And then we're summing up the amount of tracer in both of the uh, tissue compartments. Okay. Right. So our goal with the uh, filter is then to estimate these five parameters for each patient, given their individual data from uh, the PET imaging. Okay. So in order to, um, to do this, we applied a Bayesian filtering scheme. Specifically, this was a particle filter um, where we actually used as um, to get sort of some information to set our prior distribution, uh, a nonlinear least squares, uh, quasi-Newton type algorithm to estimate hyperparameters for the model uh, with respect to the data. And then we use these hyperparameters to inform our prior distributions for the filter. And then we refine the estimates of the parameters based on the filtering uh, routine. So this is really a two-stage update. First, uh, an optimization routine to get an initial estimate for the parameter values. We then use those to define the prior distributions around those estimates and apply the, the filtering scheme um, over the sequential data. This is just an example of a resulting histogram. So I have here uh, just one parameter. This is the uh, V0 parameter for one of the HE patients. The red line showed what the mean was actually if we just used nonlinear least squares. And then what we see here in black in this histogram is our resulting uh, posterior estimate of the parameter from our filtering algorithm where the mean of this is now shown in, in dashed black. So you can see that the mean actually shifted. We're on a, a fairly small scale, but the mean shifted away from what just a straightforward uh, optimizer would tell us and gave us a little bit more information um, in terms of the uh, distribution of possible parameter values uh, in this case for this patient. We did the same thing for all of the patients, right? We knew we have them labeled, so we know which group they're associated with but we actually performed this estimation for all parameters for all patients and summarized this information in histograms. So the uh, red dots here were these uh, nonlinear least squares estimates. And then you can see that the histograms uh, actually encode the information from the filter from the uh, resulting posterior samples, right? So this was the V0 parameter, that virtual volume of the capillary for each of the patients. 
And we wanted to try to see if there was any statistical difference between the groups, right? Our healthy control groups, cirrhotic uh, liver and the hepatic encephalopathy patients to see if there were any distinctions in these parameters between uh, the groups. And what was actually interesting is the, the uh, volume of the capillary. You can see for healthy control that it can vary quite a bit, right? You can have some patients that have very small uh, values and you have some that are, have larger values. Um, in the CL patients, we actually had fairly large, but again, still variant. But in the HE patients, you can see that it's actually quite consistently smaller. And we could actually show statistically uh, that this is uh, significantly different than the other two groups. So the HE patients uh, that we studied had smaller uh, V0 parameters overall uh, with respect to um, uh, the patients uh, in this study. Okay. So that was one interesting finding. If we look at the other parameters, uh, also of interest was to see that actually the uptake of the astrocyte from the blood to the precursor compartment in the brain was also uh, significantly smaller for the HE patients compared to the other two groups where we're, there wasn't much of a distinction. Um, but the other parameters really weren't different enough to give a, a significant indication that the HE patients were um, having different metabolism, specifically for K3, right? This was the the change in the, in the acetate tracer from the precursor to the product compartment. Uh, this is really no uh, different in terms of the statistical uh, significance than the healthy control or the cirrhotic liver groups. So this was actually an interesting finding to see that really this, um, the, the severity of the liver disease in this particular case wasn't really indicating much in terms of the change in the metabolism uh, with respect to this transport rate. Okay. So um, this was one application that I thought I, I, I quite liked uh, working on this project. It was, it was an interesting combination of a couple of different things where really we can see how this, um, how this imaging modality and this um, procedure can be applied, this filtering procedure can be applied to estimate these parameters across patient groups and then do this type of study where we're trying to determine um, maybe consistencies or inconsistencies among patients with respect to the different um, parameter values uh, in the model. Okay, okay. so uh, that was one application. Uh, time permitting, I'm not sure how I'm doing. Um, I can continue on. Is it, uh, do we do we have more time to go? I see it's kind of. We did start a bit late, so it's only fair. But uh, people might have to leave if they have to leave. Don't take them through. Thank you. No worries. Thanks so much. Um, so maybe I'll just briefly touch upon this uh, second part of the talk. This has been work that I've been uh, excited about recently. So. Um, I had mentioned at the beginning of my talk that some parameters could be constant, but some parameters could also change with time. So in the case when we have unknown parameters that actually do evolve with time, uh, so theta now is no longer just theta, theta is theta of t, it's some function of time. We now wanna perform our update in our filter to actually estimate um, a joint distribution of the states and the parameters where now the parameters themselves are also time dependent. So we'd like to now account for this transition similarly as we did before where we were predicting the state values and then updating those with respect to the data. We now wanna predict both the states and the parameter values at our next time point and then update that those both with respect to uh, the data that we're given at time j plus one, okay. So this is quite uh, a nice problem. It's interesting and, and, and quite challenging because unlike the dynamical system that we have to represent the change or the time dynamics in our states, we don't have an expression for the dynamics of theta. So we don't have an equation for d theta dt. And it leaves us with um, really the challenge of determining a surrogate model that's appropriate for the parameter time evolution. So there are different ways that you can do this. The idea is that we want to now try to extend the idea before we were artificially evolving the parameters in time with the hopes of converging to a constant. 
In this case, we'd actually like to really evolve the parameters with time, but we need to have an equation that, that somehow represents this evolution uh, fairly with respect to um, our model. So my uh, research group uh, has been working on this for the past uh, several years. Uh, really working on different methods that we could use to estimate time varying parameters in this setting. So I have a couple works mentioned here. Um, depending on the characteristics that we know about the, the parameters, if they're periodic, for example, if we have some sort of structural information, we can use this to our benefit and we can apply different uh, methods to estimate the parameters. Uh, so I've worked with interpolation based methods. Um, a recent paper describes a Fourier series-based approximation method. Um, and another recent paper, I have uh, the citations here, um, can use systematic uh, filtering approaches to actually track the parameters, very similar to the, the model states, along um, with the sequential uh, updates. So in this uh, parameter tracking framework, we can also uh, define an evolution model for the parameters. Um, one example being a, a simple random walk model. So we would model the parameters at time j plus one to be, um, right, whatever their mean value was at time j, right? So this the value at time j plus we're going to add on some, some innovation to this as well, which then leaves us with another covariance matrix that's unknown and needs to be estimated along with uh, the parameter of interest in order to have a systematic filtering approach um, that we can then use along with the, the state evolution equation to define this joint update of the states and the parameters. Okay, uh, so uh, maybe I'll just quickly show uh, one application of this that I mentioned, which was the, the laser tissue interactions, but I won't go into too much detail and I'm happy to chat more about it. Um, in terms of uh, any questions uh, or uh, further discussions that we'd like to have. Um, but th this framework allows for more flexibility if we don't know whether the parameter is constant or time varying. This allows us to account for the fact that the parameter could change with time and we need to do something uh, along these lines to be able to predict this. All right. Uh, so one application uh, that I've been working on with respect to uh, this type of parameter tracking that I mentioned is with respect to laser tissue interactions. And just to give a brief motivation as to why we might be interested in this, um, we can think of actual medical procedures that are using lasers um, for either ablation or in this case, looking at this uh, type of photothermal therapy. Uh, this is a particular, uh, these illustrations are showing uh, a laryngeal surgical procedure. Uh, using an endoscope. So this is an in-office procedure um, where the patient is awake and the physician is passing the endoscope, right, nasally uh, down through into the throat. At the end of the endoscope, there's a laser fiber that can then apply uh, pulses of a laser to uh, the growth in the, in the larynx um, with the idea that as we're applying the, the laser, we'd like to necrotize the tissue so that it, the, the damaged tissue so that it would, right, necrotize and, and uh, fall off or kind of disintegrate, right? But the question might be then, how do we actually um, efficiently apply this, this treatment where as we're applying the laser, we could hypothesize that the, the parameters of this tissue are changing, right, with respect to the laser. Uh, specifically with respect to how it's absorbing the light and and um, and actually the the other physical prop properties of the tissue under the hood as we're applying this procedure. So, is there a way that we could estimate as we're applying laser pulses how the laser is interacting with the tissue and be able to track those characteristics over over time? Uh, so that was really the motivation for this work, where we're considering uh, a laser tissue interaction model and trying to understand some parameters that relate to the tissue physical properties. Uh, two parameters of interest in this case are the optical properties. So these would include the absorption and the scattering coefficients of light, uh, which really determine how light is uh, penetrating the tissue and what fraction of the light is actually absorbed, uh, which 
is really vital in order to correctly plan and carry out these laser uh, treatments. So the fact that these could vary from individual to individual, they could vary from site to site, uh, depending on uh, right where, where the, the therapy is being applied time to time. This problem of tracking the optical properties is of interest um, in, this, in this application area. So um, with a colleague actually in robotics engineering at WPI, uh, I've been working on this problem and we've proposed a, a computational framework that will allow us to identify the tissue optical properties during this type of thermal laser tissue interaction using uh, a different type of Im imaging modality. So we're actually using a thermal camera to obtain surface thermal response to the laser uh, irradiation. And we're using a Coleman filtering, ensemble Coleman filtering type approach to track the dynamic changes in these properties uh, during laser exposure. So um, the benefits of this approach, right? We actually are able to estimate the properties as well as track some of the temperature at locations below the tissue surface, just given uh, temperature readings from the surface. And this could be potentially straightforward to implement in a clinical setup. For example, if we were using a miniaturized infrared camera at the uh, bottom of the endoscope, that could go along and actually take thermal uh, measurements of the tissue surface during the procedure. Okay. Uh, so just a quick uh, illustration of this framework, we can see that the, um, the laser is being applied to the tissue and we have this thermal camera that's actually capturing images dynamically of uh, the thermal response to the laser uh, irradiation at the surface of this tissue. Okay. And the filter then is taking these readings systematically, right, where we're making uh, a prediction using a, a thermal laser tissue interaction model, which is uh, described using PDEs, and updating the predicted behavior with the observed uh, thermal response and using an ensemble Coleman filter to do this updating procedure on the unknown light absorption and scattering coefficients, as well as other unknown parameters that could be involved in the model. Okay. So um, just for sake of time, I'll quickly show this is the, the PDE model that we're using to, to model the thermal um, interaction. Right, so you can see it's a three-dimensional uh, diffusion equation here uh, where we're assuming we have like a block of tissue and we have the, the temperature here that's being uh, represented here by capital T. There's a parameter, which is the volumetric heat capacity. There's another parameter involving the thermal conductivity. And there is a source, which is our volumetric power density, which is represented by the beam power of the laser times the light absorption. And this light absorption term is where those optical parameters that I mentioned come into play. So without going into too much detail, just for sake of time here, um, we do have a way of using Monte Carlo sampling to actually uh, determine the length of our uh, simulating these, these photons as a discrete random walk. And we're keeping track of where the photons are depositing energy, where the length of each step is determined um, by this equation, which involves the absorption coefficient and the scattering coefficient of, of, the, um, of the tissue. So these are two of the parameters that we're trying to estimate. Other two parameters that we can consider are also this uh, heat capacity and thermal conductivity parameter in the model. Okay, okay. Uh, so we have this assumed setup, and this is uh, right now I'm showing simulated data where we would assume this block of tissue, we're making some assumptions that the surface is flat, and we're assuming that the laser is directly uh, right at a 90 degree angle. We're measuring the temperature reaction at this origin location right at the center of the laser. And we're applying, um, we're just assuming this location has measurements over time of the uh, thermal reaction, and we're gonna try to estimate those parameters, okay? So I have some more details here, uh, which I'll just uh, skip over, um, right, as how we're, um, we're assuming this, this temperature is observed through this, at this point, virtual uh, infrared sensor, monitoring it at the reference point, and we're then corrupting the noise, uh, the, the data with Gaussian noise to simulate the sensor 
uh, noise that we would expect, right? Uh, so just uh, a few simulations to show how this works with time varying parameters. I'm assuming that over the pulse of the laser, so we're applying the laser for five seconds and then the pulse right turns off, the laser turns off for the remaining 10 seconds. And during this time, which is shaded in gray here, we're assuming that the absorption and the scattering coefficients both increase. And in this uh, case, we're just assuming a simple linear increase in both of those parameters. Once the laser is shut off, we assume that it just stays where it is and remains constant. And this is an example of what that tissue temperature looks like at that origin, at that reference location that we're focusing on. So you can see that we have an increase in temperature over the pulse of the laser, and then it starts to uh, decay over time after the laser is turned off. Okay. Right. So this is an example of the results that we're seeing um, with respect to the parameter tracking. So the top three are the predicted surface uh, temperature here on the left and the predicted temperature profiles at a few points underneath this issue, uh, the, the tissue surface, excuse me. The absorption and the scattering coefficients are tracked here in the bottom. And you can see now how we have a little bit of a different behavior with respect to how the parameter tracking is working. The mean is still in red and the uncertainty bounds are in the, in the dashed red bounds. And we can see that as we're in, uh, able to track this increase nicely for absorption, it's a little bit under the, the true in increase for scattering, but the scattering coefficient is actually less um, sensitive than uh, the absorption coefficient is uh, with respect to this data. So we're still able to track this increase, but just a little bit less in terms of the actual magnitude. Once the laser turns off, you can see that we switch and we're actually able to track constant behavior for both of these parameters once the laser pulse ends and is shut off. But the uncertainty actually increases a little bit after the laser is shut off because now we're losing those dynamics as the temperature profile is, uh, is cooling down. Okay. Right. Um, we've also done this where we've estimated also the, the other two parameters that I mentioned in the model. Uh, and we've had similar results here. You can see the four parameters down at the bottom. So we are able to track. This now becomes a more complicated problem because we have more parameters involved, but we are able to track within the uncertainty bounds those true profiles of the parameters, both the time varying uh, optical properties and these constant um, other physical properties of the tissue. Okay. So that was quick. Uh, I, I know that that was a quick overview. Um, so if anyone has questions or would like to chat about this, I'm happy to chat offline. Um, just as a quick summary of what we discussed. So we talked about sequential Bayesian filtering methods for parameter estimation in dynamical systems, where we can use the mean estimate and the um, kind of uh, distribution of the estimated, estimated parameter values as a measure of uh, uncertainty quantification. We talked about constant versus time varying parameters and a couple applications where we're using different types of imaging data to inform the models. Uh, some of my current and future work includes further enhancing these methods to be more systematic for online estimation of time varying parameters and continuing uh, to look at these real data applications. Uh, there are some applications I'm working on in neuroscience and we're currently working actually to uh, validate this method for the laser tissue interaction with experimental data that's coming from the lab. So we're not at the stage of clinical trials or anything like that yet, but we're looking now at actual um, experimental data from a lab setup uh, where we have uh, the laser fiber uh, attached to a robotic arm and we're applying these uh, to uh, various proxies for a tissue sample and trying to actually um, get back these uh, physical properties of the, of the sample uh, in this case. Okay. Uh, so I just wanna acknowledge my support from the National Science Foundation and then end with a couple references in case you're interested. Uh, thank you again so much for your time and attention. I very much appreciate it. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. It's uh, very interesting to see these methods applied to um, uh, real world problems. Very question. Simon? Uh, hi, thank you. It's very interesting. Uh, Simon Irish, UCL. Uh, if I understand it right, what you're, when you talk about the parameters, you're saying your model is an ODE 
uh, and it's the parameters, it's the multipliers of the differential operator that are unknown. Is that correct? But in other words, you know the you know the ODE, but you don't know the parameter. So, yeah, that's correct. There is other, you know, there's other approaches where you say, you know, the function f is some uh, com, you know, a combination of Differential operators, maybe even integral operators, other functions, you know, like a dictionary of functions, and you're trying to learn PE itself using, I mean, you probably know Cindy, uh, mm. and, and there's other, other methods that are essentially learning the model. And so I wondered if you considered any of those. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I haven't considered those, uh, you know, in full detail in, in this case, but I, I, am, I am aware of those methods. And this, that's a very um, great question, because I think that this would be very interesting to think about, right? As we know, no model is correct. So, so we're making assumptions about the dynamics, but there certainly are modeling errors that are involved here. Um, that would be interesting to compare if we are trying to instead learn the model uh, from some of these different techniques. Yeah, I might get in touch with you. We have a conference in yeah. first week in July. You might want to attend. Anyway, well, I'll, okay, very good. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it more. Awesome. Yeah, it may remind me of Bill. I know it reminded me of reaction networks on graphs, right? Because you know, yeah. it's a simple graph there. Yeah. And if you have a lot of you know metabolic or or um, maybe in a chemical plant or something, lots of different reactions, then identifying the um, ODE, as Simon said, it is actually identifying the graph, maybe um, coefficients on the graph, but they could be zero. <laughs> exactly. So there's a whole graph yeah. identification ODE. Yeah, and you can do this part of something else. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. There's a lot of connections. I am uh, on a different application. I haven't discussed here, looking at some of these graphical models with these dynamic Bayesian networks, which I think are related. So it would be great to talk more about this. Well, I, I suggested that I, I don't know who's around and how big everyone is. Uh, at, at the end of days, actually, we do discussion with so that we tend to arrange it. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it. So that in the chat I saw was Paul saying thank you for the English talk. Uh, I saw that. Yeah, no, no, it, I, I saw it popped up. I read it. it popped up pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, just one other thought. Actually, that that a, a lot of um, uh, kind of weird new tomographic methods might be applied to additive manufacturing because um mm. you, you know you kind of want to want to monitor something as as uh, the stuff's laid down and it, it's just your uh, your application to using kind of laser ablation and uh, various kind of laser surgery types of things and i thought actually that looks quite similar to additive manufacturing in a way um well it's, it's subtractive manufacturing right in the case of ablation but um, it, it just made me think, I, I expect we'll see a lot more integration of um, monitoring techniques, including imaging, during the manufacturing process to, um, you know, identify parameters so you can do the control better. And uh, I'm just thinking that's probably going to be a big area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That is that is definitely uh, connected, I think, and, and that makes a lot of sense. So. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to look, to look a little bit more into those applications. I'm also going to be fashionable for funding, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. Next generation manufacturing. Right? Yeah. Can I, I have another thought on applications as well. So we've spoken a lot about multi-static radar mm -hmm. in this program. So multiple distributed sources and receivers. Um, the same in solar is harder because you don't know the sea state. So you don't know the rate R. Oh. And it's different between different measurements. So actually, then, the, the, most of the information you might have about that is as you record reflections, 
from different positions of, of sonar measurements. And, and so there's a there's an updating parameter estimation problem there. Is that a, to understand? Are they nuisance parameters? They have to be called them. Mm. Actually, yeah. 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 But, but, but the observation, you still have really find agree, you have to find them, and the other three yeah. observations you have of them are just buried in, in the thing you're trying to yeah. So there must be a lot of nuisance parameters for imaging types of things where you update your model of the nuisance parameters as you go as you go along with this. Because yeah. but presumably though, because you're using recursive things, I mean that's fine if you want to control it or something, but if you just want the parameters after the fact, then you do better by fitting the whole time series of data, right? Rather sure. than do it recursively. Uh, so, so this these kind of lend themselves to when you want the answer, kind of pretty quickly, so that you can modify what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely, and certainly. And if you have the whole time series, you can absolutely use other methods. You could use MCMC. You could use uh, nonlinear least squares in some of these approaches. Um, even then, these methods are are nice to have the level of uncertainty that we have compared to a nonlinear least squares point estimate. It's these methods allow us to actually have the, you know, a, a discrete sample from the probability distribution that we can use this information um, to help quantify the uncertainty. Um, and th th they can be, depending on your MCMC method, they can be uh, maybe a little bit more uh, computationally if, uh, efficient or cost, cost a little bit less, uh, depending on your sample sizes and things like that. So um, I have used them before for kind of offline data, but I, I absolutely agree with you. The real benefit is the the sequential arrival of the the data and being able to track in close to real time. Oh, sorry, Francis. Francis just asked Jacob Jorgensen if. Uh, he thought of putting these kind of sequential methods in his cookie pie project that we made about him. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Project cool. Project cool. Boomers from. Yeah, so so we have a we have a fairly big project on UQ for inlet problems at, at the uh, Technical University of Denmark this year. Mm. And it's called CU QI Cookie. Okay. And uh, we're developing a Python platform to uh, to study well. Make it easier to do the standard UQ analysis of those problems. We didn't yet look at these kind of sequential methods. We do have, especially for PDE type in those problems with the time dependency, we have done some work there. Yeah. Um, the papers, we, we submitted two papers on the software just uh, earlier this spring, but they are now on an archive. Okay, great. Uh, could be relevant, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Um, so yeah. you can go to archive and, and search for C-U-Q-I-5, okay. that's a way of spelling a pie made of cookies, I guess, and that's, that's the idea. I, I suppose it was worth a mention because one of the aims of our program has been about uh, developing sort of joint software frameworks, yeah. to help collaboration between disciplines as well so. yeah absolutely no that sounds awesome i will look those papers up and maybe we can be in touch and, and chat a little bit more about it um i think that would be awesome great that's great right. thanks so much for calling in I, i'm sorry of course. To be here, but it's i know me too i am sorry i can't be there but it's really nice to to be able to call in and uh and chat with you so a lot of great uh ideas and i think a lot of opportunities for collaboration which i'd be happy to discuss that's great thank you very much Thanks so much. I appreciate it.